Welcome to the Reach Podcast with your teacher, Pastor Taylor Gabbard. There is a Christian allegory written in 1678 known as Pilgrim's Progress. Probably some of you, if you grew up in church especially, have uh, heard some of the stories, know some of that story. Uh, There's this scene, it's an allegory, right? So every single part of it represents something else, something in the Christian life. It's designed to teach us different aspects of Christianity. There's this, the main character is called Christian, right? Not super like subtle, but Christian starts his journey and he has a burden on his back strapped to him, tied down, and he just has to carry it. It's overwhelming. He, he has to kind of move slow. He has to be kind of bent over. It's just such a, a, a weight on his shoulders. Well, as he starts his journey, eventually there's a scene where he turns onto a road, and the road is called salvation. And at the end of the road, he can see the cross, And to the best of his ability, with that burden on his back, he moves as quickly as he can down the road. And right as he comes to the foot of the cross, with no explanation, this burden that he's never been able to get off his back, it comes undone. And it falls. And it begins to roll down a hill. And it rolls right into an empty grave, never to be seen again. And he stands there, and he just looks at the cross. It is one of the most beautiful pictures of what happens in our spirits when God saves us. That our burden that we bear in this life from the moment we're born is left in that empty grave, never to be seen again. We do this weird thing in our lives where we go back for the burden. We make it to the foot of the cross, the burden rolls into the grave, and we go, okay, it's time to move on. Uh, Where'd my burden go? How do I get a hold of that again? How do I pick that up? There's this moment in the Old Testament when the Israelites are in the wilderness and they're being bitten by snakes. And the, the, the venom from the snakes is killing them. And Moses is instructed by God to set up a bronze serpent in the wilderness. And any Israelite who will just merely look upon that bronze serpent, they'll be healed. Well, that's a kind of an odd story. It's real short. And we're told all the way in the New Testament that they were being taught something. They were being taught that someday the Messiah would be lifted up. And the only thing that it would take for you to experience the healing that he would provide when he was lifted up was merely to look to him. To cast your eyes on the Savior and experience salvation. See, the Bible is not a book about morality. It's not a book about achieving some level of perfection or accomplishing your salvation. As a matter of fact, it's really an entire book about how much you suck and how much you need a Savior because of that. John Calvin said, The more anyone excels in holiness, the farther he feels himself from perfect righteousness. And the more clearly he perceives that he can trust in nothing but the mercy of God alone. We've been in a psalm series. Matt did five lessons on the psalms, kind of covering some some categories and, and, and showing you kind of how the whole book unfolds. And then we've taken a a three-week pause to look at two specific psalms in relationship to one of the most popular stories in the Old Testament. Now, if you weren't here uh, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, we went into 2 Samuel 
where David sees Bathsheba. Now, if you remember this story, I'm gonna, and we're going to review a little bit, the interesting thing about what's happened up to that point in, the, in David's story is that the whole Bible, starting with the fall and moving all the way up to this point, the Israelites have been promised that there is one coming who will set everything right. A king, as a matter of fact, who will fix the problem of our separation with God. So you move throughout the the generations and the history and the stories, and then all of a sudden we find David. And for the first time, you can almost hear the whispers. Could it be him? Did we find the Messiah? Is this the one that's going to make everything right? See, David, David was the best among us. David was as close to the Messiah as any human would ever come. That's why for the rest of the Old Testament and in some places in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as the son of David in the line of Jesse, the root, right? He was, he was so much the type of who Christ would be that there's almost no explanation needed beyond that except, you remember David? Yeah, it's going to be like him, but better. Well, we get to this moment with David, who's supposed to be the Messiah, and what happens? He's in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he's getting lazy. And we discussed that you can't have a Savior that is ever in the wrong place at the wrong time, or you're in trouble. Because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time most of the time. And in that moment, as David is in the wrong place at the wrong time, he commits adultery with another man's wife. And then when she gets pregnant, he panics. He tries to fix the situation on his own and eventually conspires and accomplishes the murder of her husband. From there, David does really kind of the classic thing. He just pretends like nothing's wrong. He just kind of ignores the problem, tries to get on with his life. And one day, God sends a prophet named Nathan, and Nathan comes in and says, King, i got to tell you about this injustice in the land. Something really bad has happened, and you need to know. And he tells him a story about a rich man whose neighbor was a poor man. He said the rich man had flocks, and the poor man had one sheep. And one day when the rich man had a guest and, and he needed to host, he needed to prepare a meal, instead of taking from his multitude, he went next door and got the one sheep, the lamb, the member of the family of the poor man. And he killed it. And he served that as dinner. And David, in a rage at the injustice, he comes unglued. He says, tell me who he is because he's going to die today. And Nathan says, I got bad news. It's you. You are the guilty party. And last week, we looked at Psalm 51, where David is in the throes of realizing his sin and his despair. Psalm 51 is the moments after Nathan's visit when David says, God, don't leave me. Please don't abandon me. Do whatever it takes, but make me right with you. Well, there are consequences for his sin, but ultimately, the consequence, separation from God, spiritual death, is avoided. And Nathan tells David, God has forgiven your sin because you have repented because you have come clean. Forgiveness was already accomplished. It was already ready for you. But you had to experience it by not doubling down in rebellion. And you've been forgiven. So this week, we're now moving forward in time, maybe a year, maybe a little longer. 
And David has come back. And he's going to write Psalm 32. And in Psalm 32, we're going to see a man who is looking back on the worst moment of his entire life. But thinking about it through God's eyes. It's experiencing it the way God wants him to experience it. Meditating on it. Understanding what God had for him. Why it occurred. David made a promise in Psalm 51 that if God would just restore him, he would teach sinners his way. Psalm 32 is the fulfillment of that promise. As David comes back and he says, listen to what I have to say. Listen to what I learned from the worst moments of my entire life. The first thing that we're going to see in Psalm 32 is that blessed are the forgiven. Look with me. Psalm 32 starting in verse 1. How blessed is he whose wrongdoing is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is a person whose guilt the Lord does not take into account and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now I want you to see this. Last week I told you that there are three terms that encompass all of sin. And in Psalm 51, David mentions all three of those terms for sin, and he re-mentions them in the first two verses of Psalm 32. The first term he gives us is transgression or wrongdoing. And if you remember, I said that's the rebellion that happens in your mind. That's when you choose to cross a boundary with God and be at war with Him. Now, the reality is, humanity chose to cross that boundary in the Garden of Eden, and we've all been across it ever since, but every single time you choose to live in sin, you are essentially crossing that boundary and declaring war on God in that exact moment. You are actually just confirming that you are as guilty of Adam's sin as Adam was. The transgression is the rebellion in your mind. Then he says sin. This is the action. Here's the thing. We are obsessed. Humanity. Not, I'm not talking about Americans. I'm not talking about, um, excuse me. I'm not talking about people in 2024. I'm talking about all of humanity is obsessed with the actions of sin that we can see. Most religions in the world are like, if I can't see it, I'm not guilty of it. That's just behavior modification. The reality about Christianity is at no point do I care if you can actually see your sin. Why do I want you to see your sin at all? So you realize how much more is on the inside. You need to know that your sin is a representation. It is, it is a sample size of the evil that is inside of you. It is a blessing when you see your sin because then you can't forget that you are not perfect. You're not even good. So we move from that term, and then we see iniquity or guilt. This is the sin that's in your nature, the sin you were born with, the twisted part of you that was corrupted that day in the Garden of Eden, and it's been passed down from human to human to human, and we all have it. See, it's that twisted part of you that jumps up and spurs rebellion in your mind and then comes out in your actions and your words. You are sinful in your very nature. And that results in your evil desires. And then that results in your evil actions. And in this moment, David has just covered all three, the whole spectrum. Once again, he said, this is my sin. This is everything I have. But here's the best part. Every single one of those terms is partnered or paired with a term about forgiveness. I want you to see something. The opening line of this psalm, David, looking back on the adultery murder that he committed, he, d he does not say, blessed are the sinless. He says, blessed are the forgiven. Listen, Christianity is not about you trying to figure out how to stop sinning, it's you figuring out that you have been forgiven of every sin you've ever committed and will ever commit, and what are you going to do about it now? 
How are you going to react to the reality that God has saved you from the evil that comes out of the very insides of who you are all the way out into your actions? David says, blessed are the forgiven. See, when he says transgressions and wrongdoing, he actually says the term forgiven. That's a term that means it's been lifted off of you. Listen, if you live in confession and repentance, you know what you feel? The weight of sin lifted off of your shoulders. You feel the freedom, the breath of fresh air that comes from not living under the weight and oppression and enslavement of your sin in your life. He says, my transgressions have been lifted off of me. He says that my sin has been covered. And I want you to see this. That term is actually pretty specific. It's talking, they, they used to have the, the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant was picture basically a, a giant, ornate, decorated box. And they kept several of their sacred items in this box. So one of those items was the, thing, the Ten Commandments. So they put the Ten Commandments in there, and that represented that the law was in the Ark of the Covenant. And they took this with them wherever they went. Well, above the Ark of the Covenant, there was a lid. They called that the mercy seat. Well, on the mercy seat, there were two cherubim, two angels that had been built up on top of that. And the idea was God dwelled on top of the mercy seat between the two angels. That's where he lived. That's where his presence was with the people of Israel. Now, all of this is a representation Right? All of this is to teach them certain lessons, to show them certain things. But they had, they had this concept of God on the mercy seat and the law underneath him. When the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, the private place where they kept the Ark of the Covenant, he would take blood from the sacrifice and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And what they realized when that was happening is that the blood was covering up the brokenness of the law from where God was. When God looked down, he didn't see the Ten Commandments. He saw the blood. The brokenness of our lives was covered. It was covered by the blood of a sacrifice. See, only blood satisfies the law. Only blood satisfies the wrath of God, but by that same token, only blood can protect you from that same wrath and from the law. This is why we have the Passover. It was another object lesson where they saw that those who were protected by the blood, death passed over. They got object lesson after object lesson telling them that the broken nature of the law demands blood. It can be yours or it can be given to you. It can be brought to you by the Messiah. The last term, guilt or iniquity, that term is not, he, he pairs that with not accounted to you. Now, once you see, this is a bookkeeping term, okay? Think about a, a ledgers, right? So here's what happens. There's a ledger with your name on it. And there's another ledger with Jesus' name on it. And when God goes to write down your sins, he opens up the ledger with Jesus' name on it, and he writes your sins in that ledger. And then when he goes over here and opens up your ledger, he writes down Christ's righteous holiness. See, we, I've talked about this before. Some of us live in this kind of weird middle ground of fear about forgiveness that like we're forgiven, but there's going to be like this tongue lashing at the end of time where God just kind of like opens up the scroll of our life and just goes, wow, I can't believe you did all that. No. What's going to happen is when they're looking for the file that has all of your sins in it, they're going to be like, no, wait, none of that's in the one with their name on it. Where is it? Oh, we filed it over here with Jesus. It's no longer accounted to you. That is what forgiveness is. In all three of these terms, David has said, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of every level of sin that there is. 
And yet, in every way you can imagine, God has forgiven it. He's made it right. He's chosen to forget it. Blessed is the one who is not counted guilty. Look at, we're going to start at the end of verse 2 because we need to read that, that last line. It says, And in whose spirit there is no deceit, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality failed as with the dry heat of summer. So the, the first, the end part of two there is really kind of a transition statement. He says, blessed is, and then he, get, he begins to give a profile. He begins to describe a person who is blessed, right? Now, we need to understand something about this word blessed. Does blessing mean you get a lot of money? You have good health? Does blessing mean you have a certain kind of you fame level, you have a perfect job, a perfect spouse? Is that what blessings are? B- those are blessings. They are representative of the true blessing. And the true blessing is this, that you would not die and be separated from God for all of eternity. That is the blessing and the only one that matters. That is the blessing that David is talking about right here. He's saying The one who is forgiven doesn't have to die and be separated from God forever. That's the blessing he's talking about here. And he says, blessed is this kind of person. Now he says, I kept silent. He says, I kept silent and I was miserable. What is that? It's pride. Pride is the reason we don't confess. And I want you to see something. Because every time we talk about pride... Half of you don't have a clue what we're talking about. Because half of you are like, I'm not proud of my sin. Okay, let's talk about this. There are two directions pride grows. One is, I am better. Okay, pride in that way, I am better than what what you think I'm doing, what, what you think sin is. When you keep quiet because you're prideful about your sin, what you're saying is, it's not actually sin. That's pride in your sin. You're saying, Uh, That's not actually sin. I'm not actually doing something wrong, right? And most of you, that doesn't register with, okay? But here's the other direction. The other direction is shame. Shame is pride. Because you know what shame is? It's when you say, I should be better. I should be a better person than the way I acted. And I have some news for you. No, you shouldn't. You act in absolute accordance with who you are. As a matter of fact, it is by the grace of God that you are not even worse than you are. If not for God withholding your transgression and iniquity from its maximum effort, you, would be, you wouldn't be here right now. You'd be dead by now for sure because you would have rampaged in sin until it obliterated you. You don't get to get to sin and go, ah, I should be better than this. If you had any goodness in you of your own self, maybe, but you don't. So the reasons that we don't confess, the reason that we keep silent is because we either A, don't believe what we just did is sin because we're prideful, or B, have shame and don't want people to think that we're a sinner. I'm going to say this every time this comes up. No one goes home at night and thinks about you and is like... That guy just didn't sin. I know it. Never sin. No, no one thinks that. No, that's why when you confess sin, nobody's like, him? Even that guy said, no. Everyone's like, yeah, figures. Me too. Because we're all in that boat. That is who we are. And we all need to be forgiven. That's the whole point. He says he was miserable. He's wasting away. You ever feel like that? These two Psalms, man, they, they give you this feeling of despair. Because when you live in sin, when you live in the thing that enslaves you and beats you down, it's miserable. You feel thin, almost hollow. That is not the life that we were called to live. That is a shadow of what real life is meant to be. He says, God's hand was heavy on me. Is that good or bad? 
Sounds bad. Here's the deal. Often in Christian circles, we pray that God is heavy on us. So what is the difference? Whether or not you're living in sin. So here's the thing. The hand of God on me is always a blessing. Why? Because when the hand of God is on me and I'm following him, man, I'm in his presence and it's great. That's true life. That's being lifted up. But when God's hand is on me and I'm holding on white knuckle tight to my sin, God's presence and my sin don't agree. You will be sick in every way imaginable, in every part of your body, God's presence and your sin will be destroying you. Now, why, is that, why do I say that's a blessing? Because I want God's hand to stay on me until my sin gets out. I want God's hand to be heavy on me and burn up every part of my sin that's trying to kill me. See, he says this, it was a miserable experience, as conviction always is. And yet, we can praise the Lord when conviction leads to repentance because I'm no longer being held down by the throat. I'm no longer being enslaved to my sin that's trying to kill me. I pray that the blessing of God's heavy hand never fails you, that it wears out and burns away your sin, and that it brings blessings and peace always, that you know that you are rescued. Next, we see that the blessed are the hidden. Is being seen by God good or bad? We have a name for God, El Roy, and that name means God who sees me. As a matter of fact, one of the most comforting prayers you can pray when you're going through a bad time is, God, see me. Look at me. Know that I'm going through this. Because a lot of times when you're going through the worst moments in your life, it kind of feels like God is missing it. Not paying attention, didn't notice, almost like he's taking a nap. And it is a comfort to us to know that a name of God is that he sees me. Here's the thing about names of God. God's names... They teach us his character, and God will never not be his character. So when God says he sees me, he always sees me. There is never a time when he doesn't see me. So what's the difference between it being a good or a bad thing for God to see me? Look at verse 5. I acknowledge my sin, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my guilt. I said, I will confess my wrongdoings to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. This is the experience and explanation of what happened, or what's, what is happening in verse 1. This is how we experience blessing. See, all three terms for sin are also present in this verse, but here's the key. They are all being confessed. I want you to understand this. Very often, we want to stop short somewhere. Well, I know that the action came out. I know I sinned with my action, but like I didn't want to sin. I didn't actually rebel in my brain. Listen, I, 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 I'm not going to speak for everybody in this room. I'm just saying I have never not been present for a sin, ever. I have never in my life sinned, and I wasn't also to blame in my brain. Even if it catches me off guard, like it can be like last second, like I didn't decide to sin until it, it was happening, but I still decided. I was still involved. I was still like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Here we go. Right? Or we go, well, yeah, I, like I wanted to do it and I did do it, but I'm not actually like a bad person, like deep down. Like I'm not just like guilty of just like inner corruption. Like I'm a generally good person. Okay. You know, what, you know what John says about that? He says you're calling God a liar. The reality is there is nothing in you worth redeeming, and yet it was redeemed. Nothing in you worth purchasing, and yet you were purchased. And you weren't purchased for like the price you were probably worth. You were purchased with blood. You were purchased with God's blood. He cared about you 
that much. I want you to see that confession is not accomplishing anything. He's talking about confession here, but the confession is not accomplishing the forgiveness. Confession is a result of faith. Faith is how you receive grace and forgiveness. So true faith confesses and repents and therefore accesses and experiences forgiveness and grace. You don't get to take credit for getting grace. You don't need to be like, well, I did confess. Yeah, great. You said you were guilty? Yeah, that's kind of the point. But as soon as you believe God so much that it manifests in an action that is you, you confessing, you repenting, the confession and repentance are just, a, are just an action showing what's on the inside. Just like sin is an action showing that you have iniquity on the inside, repentance is an action showing that you have faith on the inside. And faith is what is the conduit by which we receive grace. If you don't confess in your life, it is either because you don't believe God will forgive you or you don't believe you need to be forgiven. That's pride and shame. It's the exact same thing. You've either said, I don't know, I'm a pretty bad person. I, I've said this to this age group before. I have so many conversations with people in this age group who genuinely think they are the worst person alive. And here's the thing. You haven't been alive long enough to be the worst person alive. you got a long way to go, okay? The reality is that is a lie from the enemy to beat you over the head constantly and tell you how bad you are. And the reality is what you are supposed to do is confess your guilt before God knowing that he loves you. And if you don't think you need to confess because you don't think you're doing anything wrong, you have a much deeper problem. You are calling God a liar. True faith confesses, experiences forgiveness, and that forgiveness has already been accomplished. The question is, do you believe that? If you are not living in confession, you don't believe that. I want you to have two additional considerations when it comes to confession. The first consideration is the Bible tells us to confess one to another. Why is that? Here is the deal. If actions represent internal, what is it when I pray to God in a private place, a confession? It's like mostly internal, right? So how do I know that that prayer to God, that confession is true? Well, do I believe I'm forgiven? Do I admit to God that I'm a sinner? Well, if I will admit to God that I'm a sinner, and I believe that, and I also believe I'm forgiven, then I'll tell you too. Because here's the reality. If I actually don't believe I'm a sinner, I'm just giving God lip service, then I don't want you to know I'm a sinner. I'm not going to tell any of you about it. And if I actually don't believe I'm forgiven, and I don't think you're going to forgive me either, you're going to humiliate me, you're going to hold me down about it, I'm not going to tell you. These are all deficiencies. When we confess one to another, you know what we do? We give an external evidence that we have an internal reality, and here's the best part. We experience forgiveness in real time. See, because when I confess to God, sometimes I'm like, does he actually forgive me? Like I told him, and I know the Bible's not like, does he actually forgive me? And then I go to church, and I look one of my brothers in Christ in the face, and I say, I messed up, man. I did this. I can't believe I did this. I'm, 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 I'm messed up in this way, and, and I just need to know that God is forgiving me. And when that person, if that person went, oh, really? <laughs> Crippled. Like, I'm not coming back to this church, right? But instead, when I look that person in the face, and I say that, and they go, man, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, you, you messed up. But God loves you. I experience forgiveness in real time. Also, when you're the person telling that person, dude, God has forgiven you. God has let that go already. You know what you're doing? Practicing Christ's likeness in real time. We're all being edified. Except when you just don't confess because you're stuck in pride and shame. The second consideration it says here that he forgave his guilt. And I want you to see this. Forgiveness of guilt does not mean that there are no consequences for your sin. Right? And I don't want to miss that because what happens is 
you do something really stupid, and you think if you just race to confession that nothing bad will result from that. All right? Why don't you think about it like this? If you take something of mine and throw it off a 10-story building, I can forgive you before it hits the ground. The thing you threw is still going to break. There are physical consequences for your actions, even if there's forgiveness. Some things you do in this life have permanent consequences. But that does not mean God has not forgiven you. Those are not the same thing. And you know what? Nothing in this life is truly permanent. There is something that is truly permanent, but it starts after this life. That's the thing I want to be forgiven before it happens. And then, as he, he forgives him, he forgives him immediately. I want you to see this. There's a word, all your Bibles should have the word at the end of verse 5 that says Selah, off to the side. Now, there's a lot of debate about what that, what that word means, and I don't, I don't like it when people tell you this is definitely what it means when there's like a wide-ranging debate. Uh, so there isn't a for sure answer. But one of the ones that seems to be uh, the most popular is it means pause and take notice. It seems to have some kind of musical connotation, and the Psalms were obviously songs, but it seems to be a point in a song or in the prayer where you're supposed to pause and meditate on what's just been said. I want you to see this. It doesn't happen in the middle of the verse. He confesses, and he is forgiven immediately, and then he says, pause and think about that. He wants you to stop right here on verse 5 and say, look at the truth of how guilty I am and how forgiven I will always be. Pause and take notice. Look at verse 6. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found, certainly in a flood of great waters. They will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You keep me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. He says, therefore, this is the part I told you, David promised to teach people God's ways if he was forgiven. He says, therefore, and he begins to teach so that people can worship the Lord with him. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Here's the deal. God is available until it's too late. No one has promised tomorrow. No one has promised 10 more seconds. The reality is we are called to seek God while he can be found. And notice the picture. The picture we're given is rushing water, waters of judgment. Picture the flood. It's not a direct reference to the flood. But picture the flood. The flood was judgment day for the world at that time. Who survived judgment day? Those who were inside God's method of deliverance. When judgment day comes, only those who are in the name of Jesus Christ will survive the rising waters. The reality is this. This verse is telling you, get right with God So even on the worst day in some people's existence, the waters won't touch you. The question I asked was, is it a good thing for God to see you or not? Here's the reality. Most of our lives, we try to hide from God in our sin. And the reality is, when we hide from God in our sin... We are exposed, we are seen, and we will face the consequences of that sin. The alternative, however, is that God hides you in Jesus Christ. If you are hidden in Jesus Christ, when he looks at you, he just sees Jesus. That is is the way you want to be seen by God. It's a good thing for God to see you when you are hidden in Jesus Christ. It is an incredibly terrifying thing for God to see you when you are trying and failing to hide from Him in your sin. He says, 
you keep me from trouble. I want you to see this is not petty, right? This is not petty trouble. This is big trouble, right? This is, the Bible is not, the Bible, there's not a theology or a doctrine in the Bible that if you become a Christian, smooth sailing. That's not how this works. That is worth saying because we happen to be in a hotbed of that doctrine and theology. You know people in your workplaces, in your schools. You have friends who attend churches where they tell them every single week, if you just have more faith, God will just give you everything. That is just not true. L- listen, you don't even need to read the Bible for that one. Hear me out. Just look at church history. That is not the evidence of the Christian life throughout church history. It has not worked like that. You don't even have to go that far. Just look at Christians in other countries right now. It's not going well for them. Do they just have no faith? Right? I would be willing to to posit that Christians in other countries right now who are being persecuted for their faith have a lot more faith than we do. Because nobody's trying to kill me right now. There is no promise in the Bible that you will never have a bump in the road. But what is this talking about that he keeps me from trouble? I I just want you to look at one place in the Bible. Peter is walking on water. The waves are around him. He looks at the waves, takes his eyes off Jesus. He sinks. Jesus pulls him out of the water. And then what happens? Do the waves stop? No. The waves don't stop. The difference is when you're walking with Jesus, you're above it. It doesn't mean that life stops having turmoil or chaos or pain. It means your focus is in a different place. It just hits different. You don't have to experience life with the misery of drowning. Because you can experience it in the freedom of walking with God. He says that you surrounded me with songs of deliverance. I want you to just think about that for a second. Being surrounded is like a really negative thing. Being surrounded is really bad. Like, you're surrounded, they're closing in. It's not a good day. Here's the deal. You are surrounded by your sin. And your only hope is that there is another layer inner to that one that is God surrounding you in a defensive posture. Your sin is trying to choke you out. And unless God surrounds you, unless he circles the wagons, you're not going to make it. And what does it say he surrounds you with? Songs of deliverance. He surrounds you with reminders of how much he loves you and how much he's saving you. When you walk with God, he wants to make sure that it is really hard for you to forget how much he loves you. You know how you short-circuit that? Don't open up your Bible. Don't come to church. Don't be in discipleship. Don't do all of the things that God uses to perpetually and, and constantly tell you how much he cares about you. Yeah, listen, some of you have bought in. Some of you are doing everything. And even on the bad days or the low seasons, you know Jesus loves you. And some of you are still drowning on the outside because you won't put yourself in the places for God to tell you constantly how much he loves you. That's on you. And I will be the first person to bug you about going to church anytime you want. I think you should be here every chance you get. Why? Because there's life here. Because we get filled up here. Because where else is anybody telling you that they love you and it's real? Where else can you hear that God loves you? I pray that your only hope to survive sin is the constant reminder of God's love surrounding you. I pray that you stop hiding in sin and start hiding in Christ. I pray that you're set free. The last thing we see is that blessed are the glad. Gladness is not self-affirmed happiness. There is an old Gaelic confession of faith. 
It says, we believe that all our justification rests on the remission of our sins, in which also is our only blessedness. As the psalmist says, we therefore reject all other means of justification before God, and without claiming any virtue or merit, we rest simply in the obedience of Jesus Christ, which is imputed to us as much to blot out all our sins as to make us find grace and favor in the sight of God. And in fact, we believe that in falling away from this foundation, however slightly, we could not find rest elsewhere, but should always be troubled. For we are never at peace with God until we resolve to be loved in Jesus Christ. For of ourselves, we are worthy of hatred. There is nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ, but the sacrifice of His body and His blood. If you are not in His name, however so slightly, you will be miserable. But when you are in His name, you will experience the true love of God who just wants to be with you. I want you to see David now writes the exact words that God says to him. Look at verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will advise you with my eye upon you. Do not be like the horse or like the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle, to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near you. God says, I will sanctify you. I will watch over you. See, the horse and the mule, they're only obedient because they have a bit and a bridle, because they are enslaved God is trying to bring you close to him in freedom. He's trying to woo you to himself and hold you in love. Look at verse 10. The sorrows of the wicked are many, but the one who trusts in the Lord, goodness will surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy all who are upright in heart. As I thought about how to explain to you what's being said here, how to really make it make sense, I went to my, my hero, Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher in the 1800s, and he has a book called Sickness Unto Death. And in that book, he describes the despair of sin at varying levels. As people are completely oblivious to their sin at some levels, oblivious to their despair, all the way to the person who is most defiant of God and shakes their fist at him. This is what he says about the person who is defiant and wants to be justified apart from God. He says, He then heaps upon this torment all his passion, which then becomes demonic rage. If it should now happen that God in heaven and all the angels were to offer to help him to be rid of this torment, no, he does not want that. Now it is too late. Once he would gladly have given everything to be rid of this agony, but he was kept waiting and now all that's past. He prefers to rage against everything and be the one whom the whole world, all existence has wronged. The one whom it is especially important to ensure that he has his agony on hand so that no one will take it from him. For then he would not be able to convince others and himself that he is right. The end point of your sin is to want to be in torment So you can keep shaking your fist at God and telling him that you're the one that's right. That's the only place that road ends. Wherever you are on it right now, that is where it goes. I pray that you look to the name above all names, Jesus Christ, and are free from sorrows that only the wicked experience. Kierkegaard says, you can want to exist without God, but it just brings depression. You can want to exist in spite of God, but it just brings defiance. Both are despair. 
It's not blessed are those who are happy with every choice, with every self-proclaimed reality. It's blessed is he who is glad only in Christ. Rejoice, you righteous ones, because you have been made righteous. Shout for joy, you who are upright in heart, because you have been made upright. It's blessed are the forgiven, not the sinless. It's blessed are the hidden in Christ, not the hidden from God. It's blessed are the glad in the Lord, not the happy with all their self-determination. It's blessed are those that God has rescued. I wish in my pride that I can tell you that I, I'm doing great and I've just been crushing this life thing. But here's the reality. I have worst moments of my life. I have dark seasons. Low points. Full of despair and defiance and shame. And here's what I've realized. Blessed are the forgiven. Because I can look back on the worst moments of my entire life and praise God that they got me to hear. Blessed are the forgiven. There are two people, two kinds of people in this room tonight. And I want you to hear the message to both of those people. If you are a believer, here's the message to you. Confess your sins one to another and shout for joy. Because he saved you. If you are not a believer, I want you to hear the message. Confess your sins and shout for joy because he will save you. Don't leave here without settling your business with Jesus Christ. Guys, this is Matt O'Mealy, pastor to young adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that is defined by real transformation and the sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We are available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.